Thank you very much, Jeremy, for the invitation to come back again. Super venue, um, lovely building, and a great meeting. So thanks very much. So uh, yeah, as I, um, as Jeremy said, for the next uh, 40 minutes, I'm going to talk to you um, a bit about some work on class two tetramers, and um, but particularly I'll be talking in the context of cytomegalovirus. So this is the structure what I'll be talking about. I'll give you an introduction to CMV and very briefly what's been known about class one tetramers over the last. Uh, 20 years, actually, quite a long time. Then we'll talk about some recent work I'm published on class two tetramers and what that begins to tell us about CD4 cells against this virus. And then I'll talk to you about CMV, whether it really matters or not uh, to human health. So um, it's lovely to be back in Oxford. And uh, this actually is the first picture of tetramers. I was the first person to use class one tetramers in human cells. And it's about a mile away at the John Radcliffe Hospital. And this is actually the first 2D plot. John Altman came over from uh, Stanford with these reagents, and he'd never stained any human cells, so we stained some cell lines. And only one of them worked, so he was very worried. He was on the phone to um, Mark Davis, but then we found out only one of the cell lines was actually killing, so that got him excited. And then we bled a patient with hemophilia, and uh, Mark, we did this work overnight. Actually, he wasn't here, but he was on the phone telling me about it. Uh, it was a very exciting Friday evening. So this was the first class one tetrama. Blood of a patient with HIV infection. This is the HIV tetrama, and they were all RO positive and CD38. I'm actually going to talk about those molecules even today. So that was very exciting, and um, where are we after 20 years? Well, within about a few months, we used CMV. Now, I was interested in cytomegalovirus because it's a problem in bone marrow transplantation. So we made a CMV tetramer, and we thought, well, you know, HIV is an exciting virus, and you get a big immune response to HIV. We won't expect anything with CMV. If people have published that the immune response to CMV was negligible. Anyway, we stained these people's blood with this tetramer. We started to see these. I mean, you wouldn't publish that in your pro-immune catalog these days, but, you know, they were reasonable quality plots. And what we noticed was CMV was massively immunodominant, really, really remarkable size of the immune response. And um, that's really uh, why I've spent the last many years working on CMV. Now, human herpes viruses, see, I'm already losing you because you don't think herpes viruses are very exciting compared to HIV and Ebola and Zika and so forth. But H herpes viruses, remarkably interesting viruses. They probably cause more morbidity and mortality than almost anything else in the UK, certainly. And there's eight of these, and they have this beautiful protein structure that surrounds their double-stranded DNA. And you've got several of them. This is how ubiquitous of them. All of you are harboring four or five or more. And um, they establish this chronic infection. So you get them usually in the first few months or years of life, and then you have to deal with them. So that's what I've drawn on this pretty, pretty terrible diagram. But I mean, just to make you think, because you really have to deal with these viruses for decades. If I give you 80 or 90 years, you've got to maintain these viruses. And of course, they're not new viruses. Unlike HIV and Zika and so forth, we've evolved with CMV. I mean, CMV was around long before Homo sapiens. So it, as I say at the end, it's really part of your genome in a way, but it just happens to be on a virus. So you have a very subtle relationship with these viruses. And uh, all of these viruses, all eight of them, have adopted different ways of living with you. Like you've all had chicken pox, you know, when you were five. Well, that virus is still in you, living in your dorsal root ganglions. And it might be latent, you know, it might be sort of quiet, although that's under debate. And EBV, it goes into a latent state. But CMV, we think, is almost constantly testing your system. And I'll explain that later, that you have to constantly fight it. Now, the reason that herpes viruses are particularly bad, although there's lots and lots of interesting lessons coming up, is that when your immune system is suppressed, and that happens a lot, of course, due to infections or hospitalization, then you have all sorts of problems, fetal infections, organ transplantations. Okay, we'll accept that's where herpes viruses are bad, but what's particularly interesting, actually, is that their importance in, you know, you, you hopefully, you, you're relatively immune competent people, is becoming apparent. Who would have thought? And uh, maybe people here today don't. And I, there's lots of MS experts, so we don't want to get this debate. But EBV is a very credible candidate 
for a causative agent for multiple sclerosis. Very interesting epidemiology. CMV may well drive immune senescence. Now, I'll tell you today, maybe CMV is very important in vascular disease, so you can see what you think. So CMV, highly prevalent. If you look around the world, Japan, uh, Southeast Asia, Africa, it's very nearly 100%. Dropping very dramatically in Western Europe, Epidemiology is not known exactly why, but it may be something to do with breastfeeding or lack of, and because it's very highly transmitted through breast milk, and maybe we've started to break that cycle. So you could say maybe half of you are CMV positive, half of you are not. So um, that's how you can think of it. Um, now then, as I said, CMV uh, within your cells, I'll talk about where it is later. We don't really know much about it, but it, it triggers this very strong immune response throughout your life. T cells, NK cells, and antibody. But our group has really been almost all on T cells. That's everything that I'm going to talk about today, is the T cell immune response to CMV. So if we go back, uh, you know, as I said, quite a long time, it was noted uh, that CMV-positive people have an unusual T-cell profile. So let's say half of you got CMV. If I just took your blood count, I'd find that you have more T-cells in your blood. You have a higher T-cell count if you're CMV-positive. And that could be because maybe CMV is just releasing white cells into your blood. Or it could be that there's a very big T-cell immune response to CMV in your blood. And that's what it was due to. So... Uh, it's a terrible picture, but it is 15 years old. This is where tetramers were involved. So we could actually use tetramers here to measure the CMV, specific immune response. And the beauty of CMV, and it is the most immunodominant antigen, I would say, in the blood system, is that you detect these very nice pictures of CMV-specific CD8 T cells. And... Uh, you also notice that as you study older people, because you tend to think that as people get older, their immune system gets weaker. And of course, that's true. And you would all accept immune senescence and older people dying of flu and RSV in the winter. But as you get older, the amount of T cells that you commit to fighting CMV goes up and up. Um, and here's some examples. I'll show you some more. I think shamefully looking back, you know, it was quite interesting that when we were staining you know, in the lab, again, 20 years ago, I think we had one lady, she was a secretary. She was probably about 55 or 50, you know, very reasonable age. But at the time, we thought she was elderly, you see. And we started to notice this pattern of increased uh, T cells in older people. So, um, interesting. So there's, there's an example of an older person. So quarter of all their CD8s in their blood um, is directed to CMV. And there's lots of papers published on this. And some people have called this a me memory inflation. It's a very memorable term. Your memory T cells inflating during your lifetime. And actually, the antibody uh, response also inflates over time. So you would almost think your immune res response to this virus is getting stronger. Why is this? Well, the thought is, and there's probably reasonable evidence for this, is that when you have CMV, and if you look in Africa, let's say, if you look at human evolution, um, almost everyone gets it within the first year of life. So let's say it's natural for us to get CMV in breast milk in the first few months of life. So you establish your CMV in a variety of tissues. I'll say to you today, maybe endothelium is an important tissue site. And uh, it sort of waxes and wanes at an extremely low level. But sometimes it reactivates. And when it reactivates, it triggers a T-cell immune response. That's what seems to happen. If you look at bone marrow transplant patients or anything like that, whenever they get a burst of virus, the immune response reactivates very quickly. And over time, over many decades, you start to see this accumulation of memory cells against CMV. What triggers this? Well, it's actually a very interesting story because stress... However you regard stress, is a very strong stimulus for reactivating herpes virus. So if you think about all these students, we're in Oxford, aren't we? You know, when they have exams, they have cold sores, you know, that's herpes simplex virus. Um, and any sort of stress, interestingly, not just physical stress, not, you know, running and all of that, but psychological stress. If I was to, psychologists tell me these tests that they do. If I was to drag any of you up onto the stage right now and say, you know, tell me about your life story and your strengths and your weaknesses, that would release lots of adrenaline into blood. You can't stop it. 
And even those levels of stress, psychological or whatever, release this uh, inflammatory response. And more of that later on. Right. So what about the viral load? So we're seeing evidence in people as they get older, bigger immune responses, enormous immune responses in their blood. What about the viral load? Well, one of the problems with CMV, one of the beauties of the evolution of CMV, because it doesn't want to damage you, um, it hasn't evolved to damage you, we've got this nice status quo, is that the viral load is very, very low. It's almost impossible to measure viral load in, in people like you. So what can we do? Uh, well, what we've recently done, which is helping a little bit, is to use digital PCR, which is a, um, a system that, where you create these uh, many, many thousands of paraffin droplets and do individual PCRs on an automated system. And CMV lives in monocytes. And if we actually pull out monocytes and do digital PCR, we can start to get a sort of quantification of CMV in the blood of people. So these, these are monocytes the negative, and these are the individual dots, and this person has a lot of CMV. So we're starting in many patients to build donors, healthy donors, to measure the amount of C in the, CMV in the blood. And although the x-axis is shocking, this says 20, 40, 60, 80, 100 years. This is very optimistic in this CMV. The CMV load within your blood starts to take off. So it does seem to be the case that around 80 the amount of virus in your blood increases quite dramatically. Is that evidence of loss of control, um, of real immune senescence at that age? Well, it certainly could be. Uh, and that is probably driving this CD8 T-cell immune response that I've talked to you about. So, in essence, the, CM the immune response to CMV is massive. Let's say you get infected here. This doesn't have times. So let's say you get infected at the age of, I don't know, 15 or whatever. You have to develop this very strong immune response, and you must maintain that for the next few decades. You mustn't be given Campath or any of these drugs, which are wonderful, but they do uh, cause CMV reactivation and so forth. Um, so you've got to maintain it to stop CMV. And then as you get older, you probably get further inflation of this immune response. And of course, we all know that T cells go from naive to central memory and then to these terminally differentiated things. Another thing that's come out of CMV is that it drives T cells right to the limit. And if you look through tetramers, this is a tetramer stain of CD8s here, you'll see that they lose 27, they lose 28. It's a very characteristic feature. That these CMV T cells have really been driven hard. So that's basically the introduction to class one and what's happened over the last few years. But what about class two? It'd be lovely, would it not, to be able to study CMV-specific CD4 cells in the same way. And I mean, there are plenty of papers showing that CD4s are important in CMV. We don't even have to look at those because you know that's going to be true. You know, I mean, of course, all these different arms of the immune system are going to be important. And we know that if we use an antigen, if we just look for CD4 cells the old way, by bleeding you and putting a bit of CMV protein on your blood, we find that as people get older, again we're seeing evidence of this memory inflation of CD4 cells. So you look, look at the axis. You know, this is very big again, up to 10% of all your CD4s against CMV in some of these older people. But what we lacked, of course, was a tetram. Would it not be beautiful to study these cells directly? And the problem has been there's been fewer epitopes. Um, as I said, you've relied on functional assays, and we haven't had enough re uh, direct reagents. So we've got available uh, recently, we've managed to buy three types of class two tetramer. You don't really need to know which CMV proteins are involved or the peptide sequence. The HLA alleles are DR7, um, DRB3, and DQB1. That's, that's called, otherwise known as DR52B. Now, these stain well in CMV because we have this great fortune of strong immune responses. So there you are, your gate on your CD4s, and there's one tetramer and another one. This is just blood of donors, not be pre-stimulated. So very nice staining uh, in the blood of these uh, donors, healthy donors. And if you uh, just spike some CMV-negative blood with a T-cell clone, 
you can detect these down to you know very low level quite easily 0.05%. So they're pretty sensitive. Right, now we've got these tetramers, what are we going to do with them? Well, we stained a cohort of healthy people, um, young, middle-aged, old. I don't know why we put people into these groups, but we've also got continuous plots, and I'll show you about that as well. So it's a cohort of um, uh, yeah, about 60 patients. It's donors, I should say. And we've uh, analyzed a number of things that I'll show you now. One is we've looked at the differentiation state. Are these CD4 cells also very hard-driven, late differentiated in these people? Are they cytotoxic? You tend to think of CD4s as helpers, making uh, cytokines to help B cells. But CMV t uh, CD4s look cytotoxic. We'll look at that. We'll look at how they're regulated, and we'll look at uh, whether they are including FOXP3 positive regulatory cells. So these are just examples of staining in the blood of individual donors. You always have to pick out your best example. So let me pick out this one. 24% of uh, the CD4s in this healthy person um, against this tetram. We had one person. That they were in, they were, uh, had 51% of their CD4s against a single tetramer. Um, they'd been in hospital for a few months at the time. So it might evidence of CMV reactivation or something like that. But anyway, you get very big responses. Over time, over age, we saw a trend for increase, although that wasn't quite as significant um, on one, there you go, the p-value. And uh, about half of these are making interferon gamma in terms of um, the correlation with the interferon gamma assay. Now, what about their phenotype? Well, if you look at this plot, this is just the global CD4s, naive central memory, effector memory. Where do the tetramer positive cells fall? Well, they're effector memory. And yes, if you look at the tetramer positive cells, they're effector with relatively little reversion for aficionados of differentiation into RA re-expression. And actually, if you look at the CD4s, you almost think this is the CD8 plot again, wouldn't you? The one I showed you a few minutes ago. So very similar to CD8. So they're losing to 27 and 28, and they have a very highly differentiated phenotype. So that's quite interesting. Uh, in fact, that goes up with age as they get more driven. We can also look at T regulatory markers like you know, FOXP3 along this axis and CD25, and the tetramer-positive cells in dark purple are not within that. So we did not detect with these tetramers any traditional T regulatory cells. And um, they've got a very high cytotoxic potential, these cells. So here are the tetramer-positive cells, perforin and granzyme. And look, they're very, very highly cytotoxic. Very interesting. It's almost as if, and it probably is the accepted thing now, that as you drive CD4s very, very hard, they become cytotoxic at a terminal stage. It's quite interesting. And that actually seems to go up with age. So here we have a lot of elderly people. They've got enormous numbers of cells in their blood which are also cytotoxic. And interestingly, these T cells express fractal kind, which CX3, CR1, which drives them to endothelium. So, as I'll say to you in a minute, if we're worried about CMV and immunopathology, it may be because these T cells are damaging endothelium. So, here we go. We've got lots of cytotoxic CD4s in the blood of these uh, healthy people, targeted to endothelium. How on earth are they regulated? Well, of course, the important regulatory molecule, as David Rafe has mentioned earlier, is PD-1. This is the hottest molecule in biology at the moment, isn't it? Because antibodies to that receptor can cure, you know, 20% maybe of people with certain forms of cancer. So it's a very, very hot topic. What about PD-1 on our CMV cells? Surely PD-1's exhaustion, isn't it? We're not going to see anything, are we? Well, we see lots of PD-1. So again, on our tetra-positive population, you can see sizable PD-1 expression, and that's shown here. PD-1 is a marker of natural regulation of chronic um, antigen stimulation. Uh, and in fact, this PD-1 expression, if anything, goes down with aging. Again, raising concern about how elderly people are controlling these huge populations of cells. And I mean, this is just to show you what I can do with class 2 tetramer. So we've pulled out these cells directly using magnets and done transcriptional analysis. But I haven't got time to talk about that today. 
So our model, really, using this is that the CD4s are at present at high number. They respond to adrenaline and stress, and uh, they're mobilized probably towards endothelium on fractal kind binding, killing virus, possibly killing endothelial cells as well, and uh, controlling the viral replication. So does it matter? You know, we... we, we We've got this immune response and viral load going up in older people. So does CMV impact on the health of older people, or on their overall mortality, or indeed on vascular disease? Because I'm trying to suggest that endothelial um, targeting might be important. So I'll just show you some evidence uh, on that. So this was some work we did uh, with Carol, uh, Carol Payne from Cambridge on, on a cohort that she had of people in Nottinghamshire. And they were collected at the age of 65 and followed over 20 years. And we just did an incredibly simple experiment of taking their blood at the age of 65 and seeing if they were CMV negative or CMV positive, and then just seeing how that correlated with death. And the take-home message in this study, which was probably 25 years old when they were entry, so you've got it, this is about 19, um, you know, 1990 in the UK, that CMV positive people lived about four years less long. I mean, we're corrected for everything else because CMV is correlated with a number of factors which we can talk about. But it did seem to be the case that CMV infection was driving early death in this UK cohort. Before you panic, those half of you've got CMV. I should also say that Japanese people are very highly CMV positive. And of course, we know their longevity is perfect. So it's all a little bit about context and lifestyle as well. Now, why were these UK people dying? The reason that they had an excess mortality was very clear. It was all about cardiovascular disease. They had a near doubling of cardiovascular mortality in the CMV-positive cohort. So what about CMV and vascular disease? Well, I'm just going to tell you um, a story which we think um, may be quite important. I'm not a vascular biologist, there may be people here who are, but I think as far as we're concerned, this is memorable to me, chalk and cheese. So cheese is atherosclerosis, the thing we worry about, cholesterol, you know, the major killer that has been, certainly, although it's plummeting, actually, in terms of incidence and mortality at a rate of knots. But that's a disease of intima. That's the cheese. The chalk is arteriosclerosis, stiff vessels. Stiff, I'll show you a nice picture. There's the cheese and there's the chalk. So the chalk vessels are patent. Blood can get through, but these vessels are not elastic, and therefore they're hardened. They're a bit like copper pipes when the blood vessels that come out of your heart should be much more flexible. I'll show you a picture. This is your main artery. Let's say this is your aorta coming out of your heart, and when your heart beats, it sends a pulse wave down the arteries, and then actually that comes back when the vessel... Uh, you get some pressure back when the vessel contracts. That's how your coronary arteries perfuse your heart during the resting stage. That's when the blood goes into your heart. But if you have um, blood vessels which are like copper pipes, the, the wave goes down very quickly. It's called the pulse wave velocity. I've never measured it myself. But it's highly correlated with death and cardiovascular disease. It's a very bad thing to have, particularly if you've got kidney disease. And we've uh, published recently with uh, Charlie Farrow that CMV-positive people have stiffer vessels. Uh, we don't need to look at the details, but if you look at this, is the aorta coming out the heart there. There is less elastication, much uh, tougher vessels. So we think that CMV may be driving arteriosclerosis. And so if, if blood vessels become stiff, this can lead to an increase in blood pressure, particularly, actually, for aficionados, pulse pressure. The, the, the difference between systole and diastole gets accentuated when you have very stiff vessels. Well, what about CMV? Can CMV raise blood pressure? Well, we studied a cohort of 1,000 uh, people in Edinburgh uh, with Ian Deary. Uh, it's called the Lothian cohort. It's a very interesting study because these were people who all did their 11-plus uh, in the 1940s. And then he did, made these poor 70-year-olds do their 11-plus test at the age of 70. And he correlated all their lifestyle factors, whether it had been drinking, smoking, and how much it impacted on their cognitive decline 
Very interesting study. But we were just interested in the CMV. And what we found is that if you look at the systolic blood pressure, the top blood pressure in CMV positive people, it was three millimeters of mercury higher in the CMV positive people. So in essence, in this thousand donors in Edinburgh, healthy people, the ones who were CMV positive, when we corrected for everything else, smoking, diabetes, all that sort of thing, they had a three millimeter increment in blood pressure. Now, you might say, as I would have said, well, three millimeters is nothing, is it really? You know, But in fact, a 2% increase in uh, systolic blood pressure is what you get with things like you know, diabetes, high salt intake, and is associated with very high risk of stroke, like 20% increment. So this is likely to be very, very epidemiologically important uh, if it's seen in other cohorts as well. So that's quite an interesting observation. So, nearing the end, what can we con do to control CMV? If we think it's bad, if we think it's damaging blood vessels and more, what can we do? Well, we're just trying a study. We just finished a study of antiviral uh, treatment in old people, older people. So we're looking at that so, to see if we can reduce the viral load. And that'll be of interest. And vaccination is some way off. But eventually, I mean, human beings, you know, eradicate everything. So we're going to eradicate all the herpes viruses. It'll take a few decades. And goodness knows what our health will look like. But that's one thing that will come along in time. So the reason I raise that provocative point is, well, what is Homo sapiens? I mean, we all sit there with your 10 to the 14 cells, and you think, well, that's me, isn't it? I don't want anything else. But you've had everything else, you know, throughout life. You've had parasites, and we can probably get rid of that. You've got bacteria, and we can't get rid of those. We've tried, but, you know, microbiome is all important now. And we've got the viruses, chronic viral infections, which again, you know, we'll probably get rid of with EBV and uh, CMV vaccines. But in fact, there's a lot of interest in the virome now and, and what it can do for you. And there's bound to be benefits. There's already evidence for CMV helping to reduce cancer in certain indications. I was just saying to my colleague, we think it reduces allergies, no, no doubt about that. So they do lots and lots of good things as well as the bad things that we see in modern life. And in fact, this loss of control with aging is seen with lots of herpes virus. We know that we can get shingles when we're older. We just accept that that's immune senescence. Some lymphomas in old people are driven by EBV. It's rare, but it's definitely there. And we think that CMV and vascular disease may also be important. So, CMV which I've tried to say can be interesting, is the most immunodominant influence on the lymphoid repertoire in the blood. No doubt about that, I would say. Uh, and tetramers have revolutionized the study of the virus, and we've got class 1 and class 2 reagents now, which um, are very useful. And um, we need these reagents to try and under, uh, uncover the subtle influence of CMV and indeed other herpes viruses on human health. So I'd like to thank the, 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 the scientists who did this work. Annette has driven the class 2 Tetra work with her colleagues here. George and Carol helped on the epidemiology, and Ian with the loathing cohort, Charles with the uh, arteriosclerosis, and funding from the MRC. Thank you very much.